Hi everyone, I'm Matt Eason and welcome to the Food Fight podcast from EIT Food, exploring the greatest challenges facing the food system and the innovations and entrepreneurs looking to solve them. In today's episode, we're exploring the incredible world of lab-grown or cultured meat, what it is and the role it will play in how we produce and consume food both now and in the future. If we go all the way back to 1931, Winston Churchill published an article called 50 Years Hence, a set of speculations about the future, in which he then predicted, and I quote, we shall escape the absurdity of growing a whole chicken in order to eat the breast and wing by growing these parts separately under a suitable medium. Well, we're a little further than 50 years on, but Churchill's predictions about cultured meat seem to be becoming a reality. And to talk us through this fascinating area, I'm delighted to have with me today two brilliant expert guests. First of all, I'd like to welcome CEO and co-founder of Aleph Farms, Didier Tubia. Aleph Farms is a cultured meat startup based in Israel. In 2018, they unveiled the world's first slaughter-free steak made from cow cells, and since then have been growing from strength to strength. They're also one of EIT Foods' leading scale-ups within our EIT Food Rising Food Stars Accelerator. Didier is a food engineer and a biologist who has founded several medical device companies and has co-invented over 40 patent families. It's great to have you back on the show, Didier. Hello. Great to be here today. Thanks for having me. We're also joined by Saren Kell from the Good Food Institute. The Good Food Institute is a non-profit working internationally to accelerate alternative protein innovation. Seren leads the team collaborating with scientists and innovators to develop and fund research on sustainable proteins. And in 2018, Seren also co-founded Cell Ag UK, a society set up to allow cellular agriculture enthusiasts to connect and communicate. Thanks for joining us, Seren. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to have you both here. So let's set the scene then for our listeners. So can I ask you both, what exactly is cultured meat? Saren, maybe we can start with you. How would you define this space? Yeah, so cultured meat or cultivated meat is meat which is produced by cultivating or growing the correct cells in a cultivator to produce a product which is actually biochemically identical to meat at the cellular and tissue level. So it is meat, but without the animal. We are skipping the middleman or the middle animal, so to speak, and growing these cells directly and harvesting them for consumption. And through removing animals from that process, you are able to gain various different benefits when compared with conventional animal agriculture. Perfect. Love that. And uh, Didier, anything to add to Seren's definition? Yeah, I think it's uh, obviously an accurate definition. I would say that um, the the way we look at cultivated meat is to take domestication one step further. If 10 or 12,000 years ago, uh, people were able to incorporate into a controlled environment a natural spontaneous phenomenon for animals to reproduce and to grow in the wild, and uh, they were able to to kind of uh, incorporate this process into their backyard or a controlled uh, system in order to get better access to their food with less resources and more predictability. What we do is is very similar. We watch at uh, cells reproducing, actually dividing and, and growing and forming a tissue in nature. And we incorporate this spontaneous phenomenon into a controlled environment for the same purposes of gaining more control over or food production with less resources, more predictability. So we do see cultivated meat, uh, which is part of cellular agriculture, as an inherent agricultural practice. Instead of farming animals, we form uh, cells, basically. Right. And uh, we take care of our cells, same as uh, animal farmers are taking care of their animals. Got it. Okay, so we're farming and growing meat rather than farming and growing the actual animals themselves, which is you know really amazing. And why why do you both think that you know the world needs cultured or cultivated meat now? You know how does this compare in terms of traditional meat production? Didier, what do you think? What's the great thing about cultured meat? The benefits of uh, growing the meat directly are um, on one hand that we can produce the same amount of uh, quality food with just what's needed in terms of nutrients, water, energy to make a steak instead of sustaining an animal for one and a half, two, three years, slaughtering it and then eating only 25 to 30% of it. 
On top of that, because we grow our stacks in a closed system, uh, we can avoid the um, massive use of antibiotics, in which we see in uh, concentrated operations for animal farming. Even though in Europe, antibiotics have been banned for prophylactic uses. Actually, it has been banned in the US as well. Still, 53% of the farms do use antibiotics, and this is one of the leading causes of antibiotic resistance and uh, development of superbugs. We also avoid pathogens in meat, which is another big uh, food safety issue. We avoid potential zoonotic diseases. Today, there are seven high zoonotic potential strains of avian flu, which uh, we find in, in Europe, which are associated again with uh, intensive concentrated farming practices. And last but not least, we avoid the animal welfare concerns associated with the, um, the same industrial farming and slaughter of animals. And uh, more and more consumers in the world are sensitive to those issues as well. Wow. Okay. I mean, it sounds like an absolute no-brainer. Is Sarah anything to add? So it seems like more sustainable, more ethical prevents antibiotic resistance and sort of pathogens as well. Is there anything else that, uh, you know, we think we should name check? I won't repeat anything, Didier says. I think he covered it very thoroughly. But just to give some kind of figures associated with it, to put it in context. So as Didier mentioned, we have issues with the environment. We have issues with public health. So either zoonotic diseases or potential future pandemics, but also antibiotic resistance. We had issues with food efficiency. We simply cannot scale up the current system. There isn't enough land and we will not feed the 10 billion people we'll have on this planet in the year 2050 through this current process because it is so inefficient. And then finally, something which wasn't mentioned is just the point about animal welfare. We have billions of animals year on year suffering incredibly torturous lives in these industrial facilities. And this is something which it would be great if we could find an alternative to this, which didn't involve this level of suffering. But yeah, just to give some kind of statistics to outline, particularly on the environmental point, animal agriculture as it stands right now, the most recent data I've seen is that it is responsible for 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So looking specifically at climate change, governments and kind of globally, we really, really cannot meet our climate targets and we will not keep warming below 1.5 degrees unless we address and cut down industrial animal agriculture. But with that being said, our experience at COP26 and elsewhere really is that governments just don't want to tell people what to eat. And with that being true, we do have to find alternatives to meat which are actually competitive on taste, on price, on convenience that are genuinely as delicious and accessible as conventional animal products. We have to find these alternatives so that people will naturally choose to switch rather than being told to cut down their meat. Perfect. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks for rounding that off for us. And I'd love to go more in depth about um, the sort of sustainability side you mentioned and also that, you know, sort of consumer acceptance, which I think is super crucial to growing this space. Before we get into all of that, it, I think it'd be really good to just for our listeners to talk a little bit more about yourselves and about what you do. So, Sarah, maybe we can go back to you. So, at, at, what do you do at GFI? You know, what's your role? Uh, what are you trying to achieve? Yeah, so broadly speaking, as an organization, we work with a range of different people from scientists and businesses and policymakers to advance plant-based and cultivated meat, as well as fermentation made or microbial protein, and really trying to make these products delicious, affordable and accessible across Europe. As we mentioned earlier, I'm the science and technology manager for GFI Europe. What that involves is really trying to facilitate the academic research ecosystem. So getting as many researchers considering this a prestigious, legitimate field and considering to transition their research skills and expertise over, helping those who are doing the research, so facilitating collaboration, making sure people have access to the right research tools and analyses, and then finally, and potentially upstream of everything, making sure that academics and universities have access to sufficient research funding to do this research. Because at present, a large proportion, if not a disproportionate amount of the funding which has gone to the space is private money. And we think that there's a really important role for open access public funding to make some of the technical advancements, which I think we'll probably go into later. So yeah, though that's broadly our goals within our science and technology work at GFI. And just, I'm really interested in your background. So. I know you were you were involved in biochemistry and you were focused previously on human aging. Why did you make the switch to 
cultured meat and how did you go from one to the other? I, I, I don't nest quite see the connection, but I'm sure there is one. Yeah, so as you mentioned, my background was in biochemistry and when I was doing laboratory work, I was really focused on cellular senescence, which is the process by which cells age. I mean, that's not ah, technically right. scientifically true, but that's mm -hmm. it's, it's a good way of seeing it. And kind of coincidentally, the science around that is very relevant for cultivated me and independent of my scientific background and research interests. I've always been particularly keen on reducing my meat consumption. I've been a vegetarian mm -hmm. on and off since I was 13, 14. And I'd kind of heard about cultivated meat and thought, oh, wow, this is kind of bringing together two things which I really care about and I'm interested in. It's a scientifically interesting problem. And it's also just incredibly important and has such huge potential to displace many of the issues we've already discussed. Since then, since moving to GFI and, and in the time in between, I really am not focusing exclusively on cultivated meat, plant-based and fermentation, I think are incredibly exciting production platforms and have as much potential to solve some of the issues we're discussing and also scientifically equally interesting areas too. But yeah, that's how I came to the field of alternative proteins myself. Didier, back to you. What is it that Aleph Farms actually do and you know what's your role there? Aleph Farms is uh, cultivating high quality steaks, meaning we focus on beef on one hand and whole muscle cuts on the other hand, meaning high quality type of meat. We define quality according to three different directions. One is a sensory quality, of course, which is related to taste, a texture, flavor, and uh, all the experience you can uh, get when you eat your meat, which is uh, definitely important for the consumers. We do realize that meat is not just a functional product intended to fuel the body. Meat is actually an experience. When people eat meat, and they eat what meat means for them, rather than just feeding the body. Mm. And second, we focus on nutritional quality, which is uh, important. Um, in our views, we should switch the whole system, and we can talk about that later. We believe that there are some limitations of the existing uh, food system, which is very much focused on quantity versus quality and uh, on calories versus, versus nutrition to a large extent. And uh, we need to um, make sure that we deliver high quality nutrition, not only proteins, but a uh, good quality of proteins and all the minerals and vitamins which are associated with that. We work since uh, our early days with uh, uh, clinical nutritionists and we have very strict requirements there. And third, uh, but not least, we also talk about uh, quality. The way the meat uh, cooks is part of the overall experience. And uh, that's one of the limitations, for instance, which can happen with uh, some uh, plant-based products. Don't cook uh, the same, and we believe that that's important. So we're really trying to integrate all those uh, aspects into the products we develop. We focus on beef because of two reasons. First, the same focus on quality, but also because Ala Farms is very much focused on sustainability and food security. And beef production is definitely the most uh, impactful animal production activity in terms of environment. So that's uh, one aspect of elephants, meaning focus on uh, quality steaks. The second aspect is that we, we deal with uh, a process which is as natural as possible. We don't modify our cells. And we don't deal not with genetic engineering, no what is called immortalization, which is another way to modify the cells to make them suitable for mass production. We believe we should uh, stick to nature and mimic nature as much as possible rather than uh, modifying it. We also have uh, developed uh, five unique uh, modules which uh, are proprietary to other farms and which will accelerate the cost reduction of our meat. One of the big challenges with the cultivated meat is uh, the economics and the cost of uh, production. And here working uh, on one hand on, on products which uh, are relatively premium to start with, such as beef, which will help getting to price pretty quicker than for chicken, for instance. Uh, price parity is relative to what you compare. <laughs> it's parity with something. So the something um, is key to get price parity relatively uh, quickly. And then on the longer term, uh, we expand into additional product platforms to really uh, provide a wide range of products and, uh, and lines. This aspect of, um, of cost reduction is also uh, very much related to the supply chain. We tend to invest a lot in building the whole supply chain for the cultivated meat industry, collaborating uh, very closely with the other groups we're 
one of the founding partners of the uh, European Cellular Agriculture uh, Trade Association to also have an executive role at the APAC one. Actually, Aleph Farms is based in Israel, which is technically in Europe, but also uh, very much connected with Asia. We're working on uh, building open supply chain solutions to foster the development of the whole industry and uh, accelerate the cost reduction towards scale and uh, completely uh, animal component free growth medium and input. So we do see um, Aleph Farms role as one of the leaders in this industry to really build the foundations of the whole industry and not just of uh, Aleph Farms. At the end of the day, we need uh, the industry as a whole to be successful. Amazing. You know, you sort of mentioned a few sort of successes there. And I think it would be really unfair of me not to mention as well that you've caught the attention of Leonardo DiCaprio, who contributed to your most recent funding round, and he now even sits on your advisory board, right? So that the success that, that you're having is amazing. I don't know how you sleep or when you sleep, but, uh, you know, huge congratulations to you and, and also, Sarah, and to the work that you're doing at the Good Food Institute. So let's dive into the topic then. So let's start with the environmental aspects that you've both alluded to. So, Sarin, I was looking at um, an assessment on life cycle, which was conducted by CE Delft and commissioned by GFI, actually. So you found that cultivated meat could cause up to 92% less greenhouse gas emissions, 93% less pollution, and use up to 95% less land and 78% less water. So with that in mind, you know, Sarah, can you talk us through the reasons why you found cultured or cultivated meat to be so much more sustainable than traditional alternatives? Yeah, and just to say that that study by C. Delft that you mentioned, that was the first LCA that actually integrated in data from real cultivated meat companies. So it did involve kind of knowledge around existing production processes and therefore some sense as to how it could potentially look in the future. Broadly speaking, why is it that cultivated meat can be so much better for the environment? What you are doing is taking an inherently very inefficient system where you grow crops to feed to an animal and then you harvest a small percentage of the biomass of that animal to eat, you know, the tissues that you actually want and the rest of it goes to waste. It really isn't very difficult for a process which skips out those inefficiencies to just be much, much better from a sustainability perspective. There's less waste, there's less energy going in to get the same proportion of actual biomass or product out at the end. And very importantly, with cultivated meat, what you are doing is electrifying the process of producing Mm. meat. So because you are doing this in closed, clean facilities and the energy source coming in is electricity rather than with animals where it's out in the world and and you're having to kind of give other various bits to the animals to graze. If that energy comes from renewable sources, you can therefore just completely cut the climate impact of meat production. So it really relies on the fact it's it's kind of analogized as well with electric vehicles versus fuel vehicles. You are electrifying the process and if the energy comes from renewable sources, then you you are able to make these huge savings. And just to point out as well that with those statistics that you pointed out around various different environmental savings that you make with cultivated meat, that doesn't actually take into account that because you free up so much land when cultivating meat, because so much less land is used, because with conventional animal agriculture, you have this inefficiency of having to grow all of these crops and then just feed to animals. If you actually use all that freed up land for other things like rewilding or carbon sequestration, then the benefits would actually be even greater. It's a kind of double win, so to speak. And and these kinds of statistics only take into account the raw comparison of greenhouse gas emissions. But then the question is, okay, what can you actually do now you have all this land? Oh, we could do some really amazing stuff here. That's amazing. So, I mean, with that, you know, with all of those things apparently in its favour, Why isn't this being forced through more? Why isn't everybody kind of focusing on this space? I think there's a question of time, firstly. It's just a new area. And this is also true for the other sustainable proteins. Obviously, plant-based products have been around much longer, but plant-based products which are genuinely trying to replicate the taste and experience of eating meat are also a recent phenomenon. There simply hasn't been enough time for this industry to gather up the sufficient momentum for governments to kind of recognize the potential that is there. So I think there's a timing point. 
But I also think there is just a bit of a disconnect between the potential that alternative proteins have for climate and then whether they are actually seen as a climate solution. I think governments around the world still don't really see that alternative proteins are one of the best tools in their toolbox to meet their net zero targets, specifically relating to the climate. I think people see it for other reasons like, oh, you know, these are potentially products for vegetarians or this is diversifying our food supply and various other kind of side things. But this is one of the best tools we have available for climate change and that's not being recognised and therefore there isn't sufficient urgency and momentum around putting in sufficient government investment into it with, with other technologies which are very explicitly cli climate solutions. So, for example, renewable energy, carbon capture and storage technologies, these get orders of magnitude more funding into them from government. And I think until sustainable proteins are really seen as what they can be for the climate, we won't get sufficient government investment, despite the fact that there has been little smatterings here and there, some of the examples that Didier mentioned. But yeah, for us, I think a big priority is making it being recognised at the government level that if they really invest the billions and billions of dollars into R&D that is needed for these spaces, then they can start to realise these benefits and reduce emissions by five gigatons a year, I think, was one of the figures that came out from a recent report. Yeah. Just staying with you for a second, and I just want to make sure this is a balanced argument. I mean, are there any negative effects that lab-grown meat production could have on our environment at all? Anything that you're aware of that's come out? Nothing that I'm aware of that's come out of the different LCAs which have been done. I think, essentially, because we are at a position where a lot of this stuff isn't being done at scale yet, we still have a lot of creative kind of control and potential to input into what those processes look like. And because cultivated meat does put a lot of control back in the farmer's hands relative to conventional animal agriculture, you are overseeing the processes and you can design the inputs and outputs. It gives you freedom to actually shift things if mm -hmm. things aren't working. But honestly, stepping back, I think it really isn't hard to do much better than conventional animal agriculture on all of these environmental metrics. And Didier, to you, so I mean, Saren spoke about electrifying this process, which I love. Um, could you maybe talk us through the more technical aspect of this? So at Aleph Farms, I'm in your factory. What's actually happening? How do you grow the meat itself? Um, you know, how long does it take or do you print it? Just talk our listeners through what you do. So the process starts with uh, isolating cells from a healthy animal. Actually, as you might know, cells are the smallest living entity in any organism. And the uh, uh, cells actually are the building blocks of, uh, of life and of any tissue, including muscle tissue, uh, which is a stake in a kettle, in a cow. So we will isolate those cells and transfer them into what we call a cultivator or a bioreactor, which is replicating, mimicking the same conditions as inside the animal. Uh, the same nutritional conditions, meaning we bring the, to the cells the same uh, uh, macronutrients like uh, sugar, peptides, uh, amino acids, whatever they need, uh, micronutrients, minerals, also um, proteins. And this is actually the tricky part in this uh, kind of uh, feed to the cells, which is called uh, the growth medium. We also need to provide the cells with the proteins, which in nature are synthesized by the animal itself. Right. such as uh, albumin, transferrin, uh, different growth factors which are uh, necessary for regulating the activity of the cells, which are found in the animal and which can't be sourced easily from other supply. Those molecules originally have been brought to this growth medium by the fetal bovine serum, which uh, no one is using uh, or wants to use today at elephants who already get rid of it a couple of years ago. But developing an alternative to the fetal bovine serum required a lot of resources. Actually, the agreement we have published a few months ago with the Vacker in Germany is related to uh, the infrastructure we're building together with them to produce serum protein replacement to actually make uh, those solutions available to the whole industry at the cost, at quantities, and the, at the quality which uh, will support the increase in scale of the cultivated uh, meat space. So this is the growth medium, meaning the, the feed to the cells. And then... Um, we uh, replicate the same uh, temperature, pH, O2, CO2 saturation, meaning all the, the physical conditions within the same uh, cultivator so that the cells continue to divide 
and uh, to grow, same as they would do inside uh, of the animal itself, in order for the cells to arrange themselves into a three-dimensional structure such as a muscle tissue, the cells need to adhere onto a, a matrix. In nature, they adhere onto what is called the extracellular matrix, which is primarily made of collagen and other animal-based proteins. So we need to provide a similar matrix. In our case, we don't use any animal inputs to our process, except for the cells themselves, to so replace those animal proteins with plant-based proteins as a material for, the, for this matrix, which is also called a scaffold. And the cells actually um, align themselves, organize themselves, and interact into uh, this scaffold to make a muscle tissue. And then we just harvest this tissue, and uh, it's in principle uh, ready for being cooked. That's how the process works uh, very briefly. Amazing. Thanks for taking us through that. And do you think then, is it the medium, the serum that you're talking about, do you think that's the key to accelerating this process and scaling up? Is that is that the difficult part that has held this whole space back, do you think? The replacement of the fetal bovine serum, meaning of the animal inputs to this uh, growth medium, to this uh, feeding solution, is definitely a key to the success of the industry. And uh, I believe that the, the leading companies have already addressed this issue. I saw that Mossamid recently published a paper about their uh, um, serum-free growth medium. I don't know if it's completely animal component-free, but at least uh, serum-free. I believe that they probably have a full animal component-free growth medium, su such as we do as well. I know that uh, Upside Food in the US also has implemented some solutions. So I think that this is uh, one of the, the challenges which uh, um, I believe the leading companies have already overcome. There are other challenges which are related to building up the supply chain and accessing all those uh, um, components and inputs to the production process at a, at a cost. And as I said, not only cost, but also a quantity and quality, which would uh, support a quick increase in scale. There are some uh, um, inherent questions around the capex, the capital equipment, and the need to rethink the type of cultivators or bioreactors which uh, exist out there, which have been originally engineered for biomedical applications, which are very expensive. Mm. And we also need to define a production standard, which would be suitable for food um, purposes rather than uh, biopharma. Today, uh, cell culture is used uh, primarily for biotech and, and pharma industries. So that there are still uh, um, some challenges, you know, ahead of us. We're working actively on all those topics, obviously at Alephant, and I believe other companies do as well. Uh, where we can, uh, we partner with others, and we we tend to be, you know, as open and uh, collaborative as possible. And again, I believe that the economics and the challenges might be different for different types of products. Some companies are going for simpler products, quicker to the market, lower cost to start with. Other companies are focusing on higher quality products, maybe a bit more complex, but higher value. Mm -hmm. Some are going for beef, uh, some for chicken. Chicken is easier for a bunch of reasons. We believe that reaching the you know, viable economics for chicken will be very challenging during the next uh, 10 years, let's say, it will be much easier to reach the right uh, um, economics for uh, for beef. And so th there, are, there are a lot of different um, approaches and strategies. And again, th there is no one good and one bad strategy. Obviously, there are pros and cons of, uh, of each approach. But we do see a wide range of uh, companies dealing with uh, different types of uh, sales, products, processes. Thanks, Didier. I mean, it's, yeah, you bring up the challenges. I mean, we've You've spoken about the kind of the technical, the economic, the, the political as well. And I'd love to talk um, about the kind of consumer acceptance challenge, sort of moving into that now. So, uh, Saren, I mean, we understand the benefits, you know, from an environmental perspective, but it's all well and good knowing all of that. But implementing this and making an everyday reality is possibly another story, perhaps. So how do we get the masses, you know, the average person on the street to welcome you know, this change which that's coming. Any thoughts from your side? Yeah, so my understanding of all of the consumer research, consumer perception research, which has been done to date, is that really the fundamental foundational drivers of consumer decision making is taste, price and convenience. So that is why we push so hard for governments to invest 
into publicly funded research and development to address those particular concerns through technical development. That being said, if we look at consumer potential acceptance with respect to cultivated meat, I think one thing we have to take into account is that so far, people actually haven't been presented with two options. So people eat meat at the moment, not because of how it's made. They eat meat despite how it's made and the fact that it's the only place where it comes from. If people actually have the alternatives presented to them, so here is this meat which came from an animal, but it will have come from an incredibly filthy, polluted, overcrowded industrial farm. Or here is meat which has come from a clean facility, which is much better from the environment. It wouldn't have used antibiotics in the process. You won't have things like fecal contamination and non-communicable diseases. Which would you choose? So I think that is an important point, is people haven't actually had the choice so far. And then if we look at actual data into where we genuinely think people will go, with that being said, we have the example in Singapore when in 2019, at the end of the year, the cultivated meat, it was the first time in the world that it passed regulation and consumers could that, actually yeah. buy it. And yeah, and people people ate it. They chose to eat it. So that's that's our data point. When it's available, people did go. And then on top of that, we have seen a smattering of consumer acceptance studies, which have taken the concept of cultivated meat and presented it to consumers under these kind of research conditions to see, you know, what do people actually think about this product if it were presented to them. And all of the data we've seen from that has been incredibly optimistic. So for example, in the UK and US, we've seen that 80% of consumers are at least open to trying or, or eating cultivated meat. In Germany, we've seen figures around 58% or 56% of people looking to either try or buy it. And then in France, um, the figures are slightly lower. So we have 44% would try and 36% would buy. But these are incredibly positive for a technology which is not actually in the market in any of those jurisdictions that people are being asked. That's amazing. I never thought even now that the acceptance figures would go up to as high as 80%. That is really positive. So, I mean, it feels like, I mean, I was talking to people about this a couple of years ago. It feels like there's been a real shift there. And Didier, do you agree with Seren that do you think this is about, you know, sort of taste, cost, convenience? Are those the kind of key ingredients, so to speak, to get consumers to accept this? Yes. Okay, I agree with the, obviously what uh, Sam said, but I think it's more nuanced than that. Consumer acceptance is a much more complex issue than it, it sounds. First, it depends very much which type of product and technology. For instance, in France, we have performed some uh, relatively large-scale consumer study showing that for genetically engineered cultivated meat, the acceptance is very low. For non-genetically engineered, it's very high, up to 89% of the general population. And then two percent in Germany, and we do see a, um, a consistent, a significant gap between uh, GE versus meaning genetically engineered versus non genetically engineered. In all the countries we have surveyed, including in the UK, in the US, we've performed studies in many other countries: Brazil, Japan, Singapore, Thailand, etc. So the product has to be right, and the technology platform has to be right to drive acceptance. Second, I also believe it's important to communicate right around cultivated meat. The way we look at it, that I found that cultivated meat will be a different category of meat. We don't believe that uh, the purpose of cultivated meat should be to copy uh, one specific cut of one specific breed of one specific terroir of uh, beef steak, for instance. But same as we have a uh, white wine and a uh, red wine, which are two different types of uh, wines, both shell a lot of the same basic attributes of wines, but have slightly different value proposition and are not interchangeable. Our vision is that in uh, five, ten years, we'll have two categories of meat where uh, conventional animal farming will uh, uh, probably continue this uh, trend toward more regenerative farming practices, uh, more sustainable, extensive, uh, low input practices which is actually the purpose of the farm to fork strategy. And again, we're working very closely with uh, all those policy makers. And we'll see cultivated meat, which in our views will be potentially better alternative to concentrated farming practices and industrial farming, which uh, Siren depicted uh, beforehand. There will be differences between those two products and consumers have to understand that the goal is, is not to copy anything, but rather to build a new space within the meat universe. And, and that's also connected to plant-based. The thing that w one of the limitations of plant-based, in my views, is that it, it has not successfully so far, in my views, <laughs> again, we can argue Sarah might have other uh, 
or their views about it, but it hasn't really successfully built its own set of intrinsic value, meaning value intrinsic to the product, not intrinsic to the production process and not extrinsic value like uh, sustainability, for instance, or other aspects related to ethical angles, which are extrinsic to the product itself. For a product and a category to drive wide acceptance and become mainstream, the product itself has to embed intrinsic valuable attributes. And this is what we're trying to do at Alephants with the cultivated meat. And I believe cultivated meat has a great potential to provide unique values and unique benefits intrinsically versus conventional meat. And it will succeed because of that. I don't think cultivated meat will become mainstream because it's more sustainable. That's really useful. And I'd, I'd love Sarah and you to come in on that. You know, so we, Didier was sort of talking about that intrinsic value proposition of cultured meat versus, for example, plant-based. Do you agree that it's there, but it hasn't quite got it right yet. It hasn't found its own identity in with consumers. I think like at the kind of stepping back highest level, yes, we're, we're not quite there yet with plant-based products. They've had more of a head start with respect to time. And obviously they're out there in the market. They're growing in popularity with sales increasing across Europe kind of almost exponentially year on year. But yeah, there was a recent survey by ProVeg that showed people who really want to be flexitarian and want to cut down their meat consumption find it difficult because the present products on the market are too expensive and we're just still not quite there yet on taste. There's there's just right. still so much more room for funding for these products to be genuinely replicating the taste of meat. Obviously, with cultivated meat, competing on taste itself there's an argument there that it's it's much easier to get there. We are growing the right cell types in the right cell formation. They will have natural animal fat and natural connective tissue. This really will be much easier to replicate the taste of meat. But yeah, I still think plant-based products as a category haven't really had the time to be able to get to a point where they are competing. But I agree that, that we're not quite there yet, but I hope that we will be with, with more funding. Why don't we jump just, if you will allow us, just to the future then, where do you see this going ultimately, Sarah? And, you know, do you see the future is everybody embraces this and, you know, we all move away from kind of that traditional farming that we kind of have all gotten used to and suddenly all of our food or at least all of our meat and fish products are, are all being grown in a very, very different way? Is that is that the future you see? I see a society and ultimately a consumer marketplace, which is incredibly varied and diverse, where people are able to consume alternative products, which are much better for the environment and public health, like cultivated, but as mentioned, obviously also plant-based and fermentation made. There is that choice there, and therefore we are able to build just a better, greener farming system where these other practices, which could still involve animals in the food chain, like regenerative agriculture, are actually able to happen in a way which kind of holistically actually facilitates the native biodiversity of each country. I see a varied approach, but I think really the, the extent of the harms of animal agriculture, I think ultimately we really do have to reduce the production of animals significantly. Which approaches get us there, I think, will be really interesting and is to play for. And there are different trade-offs between the different types of production platform between plant-based and fermentation and cultivated. But I think they all have huge potential and a role to play there. Didier, what do you think? What's What does the future hold? And you know, why are you so excited about what's coming? I think for cultivated meat to grow, we need a few things to occur simultaneously <laughs> or more or less at the same time. First, we need to make sure that we develop the right products and the right platforms to meet the consumer's expectations, which is not, uh, in my views, for granted. There is a risk that uh, some companies would uh, you know, launch products which cut corners in terms of uh, quality, in terms of uh, nutritional values, in terms of safety, uh, just to uh, get there quickly. And um, it's a risk. We should make sure that we develop the product right, we invest in uh, building long-term acceptance rather than uh, kind of uh, be under pressure to achieve short-term uh, goals. We're in the long-term play here. Second, we will need a, a public-private partnership. As Siren mentioned uh, before, same as with renewable energies, we will uh, need to work hand-in-hand -hand with governments and with the European Union to get specific funding, public funding, but also 
support for investing in uh, production capabilities, for um, potentially loan guarantees, tax breaks to support the industry it's in its earlier uh, stages. And the next 10 years will be critical for the industry to move through the first stages of scaling up and, and uh, becoming competitive for the long term. And third, I would say that uh, we also needed to work uh, um, very uh, holistically on a system-based uh, approach to make sure that uh, cultivated meat will incorporate the agricultural practices, working hand-in-hand -hand with other uh, stakeholders in the space. The protein transition cannot be seen as a standalone project or endeavor. It's really very much in imbricated within agriculture. There are a lot of social aspects, cultural aspects, food safety aspects, food security aspects, which are related to proteins. I think that if we focus just on making meat production more efficient with uh, cultivating cells rather than uh, growing the animal, we will miss the point. We need really to think much more holistically on a system level which is not happening uh, enough today. I really liked some of the points that Didier was making there. So questions around kind of socially and as a society, how do we navigate this transition as we cut down the production of conventional meat and displace it with other sustainable proteins like cultivated and, and plant-based and fermentation made? I think those are questions which really have to be government-led. We can help and we're kind of thinking around issues such as how do we train the future workforce? What will it look like for that transition? How will there be potential reskilling initiatives for farmers to still play a very key role as part of this new farming system? Educating the future scientists and R&D technicians who will be working for this future industry. And then other kind of social questions. What do we do with the land that is freed up? What role does this give for farmers for more sustainable regenerative practices? Some of the things that Didier was describing. All of these things are made possible when we do kind of make this shift towards these more sustainable practices. So those are the kind of broader high level societal concerns. Looking specifically at the technology itself, I think Didier went through it all very thoroughly in terms of the key needs that need to be addressed around things like cell culture media, facilitating capex for the actual companies to be able to scale up and produce sufficient quantities of these products. I think one thing that we're seeing more and more of at GFI and that we're really excited by is the focus on these more complicated whole cut products. So mm. rather than recreating kind of minced meat, like for burgers and sausages, seeing things like steaks and chicken breasts, so people are doing incredible science with 3D printing and novel scaffolding technologies to be able to recreate these kinds of products. So even recently, I think it was Meat Tech 3D in Israel announced that they were able to create a four ounce cultivated steak using 3D printed bio inks, which is really exciting just for the sheer scale of the product that was made there. We as an organization, we fund research which specifically addresses some of the technical challenges which are kind of bottlenecking the industry as a whole. And recently we funded Professor Frederico Ferreira at the University of Lisbon. So he's using a grant to develop new ways of creating a whole fish fillet so they're using ingredients extracted from algae to create edible scaffolds, which sea bass cells are then growing, which is amazing because the kind of health benefits of fish are you know, primarily focused around lean, high protein and the presence of beneficial fatty acids like omega-3. But fish are the middlemen for this. The omega-3 ultimately comes from the algae. So if you just kind of grow the algae first and foremost as the scaffolding and then have the sea bass cells growing on that, you recreate all of these kind of amazing kind of benefits of seafood but without having to go via a fish so yeah I think kind of research like that yeah that's incredible we hadn't even spoken about sort of cell-based aquaculture which of course is probably another hour's worth of another episode <laughs> but uh that's that's amazing I mean it is really an incredible space um Saren and also Didio thank you so much for your time it's been a great discussion like i always say i wish i had more hours to talk about these things because i'm sure we could have gone into more detail didier where can listeners go to find out more information about what you do at aleph you can feel free to reach out to us either through our website aleph-farms.com or through social media linkedin or, or uh, instagram and um, you can download a white paper on a uh, an inclusive transition of the meat sector and uh, can follow us on uh, those uh, media. Where else can people find out more about uh, Good Food Institute and, and you yourself, you know, what sort of channels for people to follow? 
just to kind of plug that we do have kind of various totally free publicly available resources on GFI's website. GFI has different newsletters which give updates on the different alternative protein industries. We have GFI Europe newsletter specifically which focuses on the continent's developments. And beyond that, we are on all social media channels and that's also a really great way to see what we're up to and what the latest developments are. And finally, at the moment, if you are listening to this before the 20th of February, we are actively hiring in GFI Europe for someone with a science background who is interested in doing a lot of the community building work which I was describing earlier so really building a scientific field and getting as many scientists to come and be excited and, and focus their research on developing these products so yeah I would really encourage anyone to apply who is at all interested in that role I'm really really excited for us to be able to expand our work in that way amazing surely the best role ever as well so uh, yeah absolutely great to plug that please everybody get involved like Saren says that just leaves me so big thank you to Saren and Didier this has been the Food Fight podcast. As ever, if you'd like to find out more, head over to the EIT Food website at www.eitfood.eu. And please also join the conversation via the hashtag EIT Food Fight on our Twitter channel at EIT Food. And if you haven't already, please hit the follow button so you never miss an episode. That's it for now. See you next time. Mm-hmm.